Coming up, turning up the heat in South Africa, making barbecue charcoal the old-fashioned way. Just add water. How the Japanese make oodles of noodles. And reaching new heights, the Texas tech wizards making record-breaking gear for pole vaulters. How do they do it? Nothing says summer like the smell of barbecue smoke. Europeans alone get through 800,000 tonnes of charcoal a year. It gives off three times as much heat as wood, which is why we've been using it to sizzle our steaks for over 4,000 years. And the way we make it has hardly changed in all that time. How do they do it? KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. This fertile region is known as the Garden Province. Half a million hectares of forest give it a thriving timber industry, producing almost 8 million tonnes of wood every year. The downside of all that logging could be a lot of waste wood. But local businesses have found a way to turn that problem into a profit. As the lumberjacks clear out, the charcoal makers move in, sweeping the area for acacia and eucalyptus offcuts. Lungili Guala is in charge of the team. For some people, it looks like this is waste, but to us, it's a recycled thing. We are very creative people. We saw this opportunity for us to make something out of this. The wood comes here to ENC Charcoal. They produce 20,000 tonnes of charcoal every year. The process they use is called pyrolysis. It involves vaporising all the other compounds in the wood, leaving only pure carbon. It would be familiar to any ancient charcoal maker, only the scale is very different. To turn these massive piles of timber into charcoal, they first stack the wood in one of 28 purpose-built kilns. Charles Holly has been managing director here for 30 years. Approximately 50 tonnes of timber will go into this kiln and roughly 10 to 12 tonnes of charcoal will come out. And the cycle takes 7 to 10 days. But if you just set fire to this lot, you'd end up with a pile of ash, not charcoal. If we didn't control the airflow, we would end up with ash. Too much ash is not a good business solution. To stop the log pile becoming a towering inferno, they restrict the flow of oxygen with a series of air vents. There are holes at the base to bring in clean air, which is essential for the burning of charcoal. And they are spaced about a metre apart on both sides. Each kiln can hold 50 tonnes of wood. Once it's loaded, the entrance is tightly sealed with clay and the fires can be lit. Of course, you can't be in the kiln when that lot goes up. Passing a metre-long match through one of the air holes allows the workers to keep a safe distance. To begin with, as the wood heats up and moisture is driven off, it generates increasing amounts of smoke. This has just been lit and it smokes copiously like this for about an hour. Thick white smoke indicates that the temperature inside has reached 300 degrees and the wood is starting to burn. When the fire's really got hold of the wood inside the kiln, we then close off these two uh, ports or uh, holes in the roof. Closing the vents stops the escape of volatile gases, including carbon monoxide, hydrogen and methane that are given off by the wood. These go through a hot box where a 900 degrees Celsius fire burns them up. Finally, the vapour is drawn up the chimney. By the time it comes out, it's clear and much cleaner. The pyrolysis process takes seven days at between 300 and 500 degrees Celsius. At these temperatures, without oxygen, the wood spontaneously breaks down. The volatile gases and tar are driven off, leaving nothing but carbon. 
After a week in the kiln, they flush out the heat to stop the charcoal breaking down further. Then seal it and leave it to cool for three days. Now they can break the seals and get stuck in. This is dirty work. You can't fit any fancy machines inside a kiln. The only way to get the charcoal out is shoveling it into a sack. At this point, the charcoal looks ready. But now it's exposed to the air, there's a risk it could spontaneously burst into flames. To avoid unwanted infernos, they're dumped in a sealed container and left for 14 days to cool. The chunks that come out are all different sizes and the big stuff fetches a higher price than the small lumps used on garden barbecues. AJ Marvick oversees the sorting process to separate them out. From the conveyor, it gets separated. The big pieces goes onto the other conveyor on the left-hand side, and the small pieces goes to the conveyor on the right. 20,000 tonnes pass along this conveyor every year. These two kilogram bags are destined for barbecues around Europe. But the little bits won't go to waste. Sefiso Mbata is in charge of turning them into another profitable product. This charcoal, we take it to make briquettes. It's like a cake that is made out of charcoal that we can use as charcoal. They're not the kind of cake you'd want to eat. The small chunks are dumped onto a conveyor where they're pulverized into a fine powder. Now, Sofiso's cake making starts. First, add water, but no eggs. If it's too wet, it will stick on the rollers. If it's too dry, it won't cup it. It's got to be perfect. Of course, if this mix dried out, it would become dust again. The magic ingredient that binds these cakes together is maize starch. Now it is sticking in the hand. It is not too wet, not too dry. It's OK now. The mix is perfect, but this gooey gunk won't do much on the barbie. So this fearsome mechanical roller stamps it into perfectly proportioned briquettes. This machine make the shape of briquettes to look like cakes. It looks like two cups coming together. To remove moisture, the inedible cakes go into a 20-metre super-sized oven, powered by coal. All that remains is for the briquettes to be bagged and stacked. The factory churns out more than 55 tonnes of briquettes a day. Plenty of meat can be cooked now of this. In these parts, the local word for barbecue is braai. But good food is good food in any language.